Future, future Talk. Welcome to Future Talk. I'm Zohara Hieronymus. Joining us this portion of the program are co-authors Denise Breton and Stephen Lehman. Their Chrysalis 2001 book, which by the way has won all kinds of awards, we'll tell you about that. Their book, The Mystic Heart of Justice, Restoring Justice in a Broken World. And what they do is they ask humanity to think from the heart, to consider a model of justice that is based on reverence for life that asks of those that write law and attend the law, that beyond the constitutional parameters or broader questions we might be asking. For instance, what is the difference between justice based on mercy, established with compassion, and justice meted out as retribution, or state-sponsored totalitarianism? Might there not be something called restorative justice? In fact, there is, and there are people already practicing it. But do we en masse as a community exhibit the conditions of justice or do we simply administer in many cases laws that I suggest are without merit philosophically and much of the time are themselves not legal? So what if there's a system of justice that rests on a principle that all members are responsible to contribute in some way to society? How do we as a community show that within ourselves and in relationship to the world justice is also a state of being? Well, if you stay with us, Denise and Stephen, in their book, The Mystic Heart of Justice, will show you how. Denise Breton and Steve Lehman, their co-authored book, The Mystic Heart of Justice, Restoring Wholeness in a Broken World is what we're going to look at today. It was the winner of Spirituality and Health's Best Spiritual Books of 2001, and it's been nominated for both a NAPRA, that's the Nautilus Award in Social Change category, a finalist for 2002, and Forward Magazine's 2001 Book of the Year Award in the Philosophy category. Way to go, Denise and Steve. Congratulations. Thank you. And Steve, are you there? I am. Oh, good. Well, look, your book, as the as those who have evaluated it and singled it out for awards have already noted, it's an unusual way and yet a very important way to start looking at big questions in our world, like are we ethical humans and do we exhibit it? Share with us if one were to, in a simplified fashion, compare the justice system we have today and the one that your work, The Mystic Heart of Justice, explores as our potential, how do they contrast? Well, uh, the model that we have, oh, first of all, I want to thank you so much for your introduction. You just did a beautiful job summarizing so many of the ideas that we're aiming to explore. Um, In terms of contrasting what's going on now, it's a model largely based on on rewards and punishments. And um, there's extensive research on that, on the implications of what it does to us. And basically what we're doing in the book, and not alone, there are other people doing it, is challenging whether that model is adequate to give us justice. In fact, is it a model that's creating a lot of the problems, a tremendous number of the problems that we're dealing with? Um, That's a retributive model. In other words, that justice can be created by punishing people um, or rewarding them. And uh, the model that we are uh, exploring the philosophical and spiritual shift to is what you mentioned, restorative justice, which is about um, justice as everybody connecting with who they are, being who they are, and doing what's theirs to do. And since we're very much disconnected from that, that involves going on a healing path to get there, and that justice is somehow the process of engaging in that. One of the things, well, you do many things, but one of them in the book is you look at these indigenous models of justice from around the world, and I thought at the start of our conversation it might be useful for our listeners to learn a bit about that. In a lot of the indigenous cultures, um, which were tribal cultures, you couldn't afford to throw away your people. You didn't have enough of them, and every every member of the tribe had a specific role and value. So they had to look at <clears throat> at a different um, uh, model of, of dealing with what we would call crime, uh, what, what, what many of these cultures would call instead um, evidence of a disharmony in the culture. And so uh, their, their, the model that they, that they evolved was one of trying to recreate a harmony, uh, an ideal harmony that they presume the, the tribal culture to have. So 
Oh, um, well, and, and I think that a really fundamental difference between the Western world, which says that person committed a crime as if they are separate from the society that produces them, and the indigenous people, what you're describing, recognize that the individual act also reflect the community. That's exactly right. I mean, one of the you know, key premises of restorative justice is an idea of connectedness, that, that we are connected and that we're not just um, isolated little satellites um, doing <clears throat> doing our thing out there in the world, um, and coming from that from that premise, the the idea of harmony and disharmony makes much more sense. You you don't get a, a reward and punishment model out of that kind of a worldview, because um, it, you, punishment only takes a disharmony and makes it further disharmonious. And, and let's look at this both historically and as you point out. Uh, the qualities that it lessens in us. It lessens our capacity for compassion. It lessens our reverence for the life of both the perpetrator of a crime and the victim. Let, let's look at this issue of punishment. What does that express about our way of viewing ourselves and others, if that's our model? Right. Well, one of the big, the biggest problem is we understand it about a reward punishment model, and certainly with punishments, it's very clear, is that it shifts the motivation from an inner motivation to an external one. In other words, you don't, if somebody's controlling you through rewards and punishments, you're not feeling like you can follow your inner guide anymore. You've got to put that aside to be able to do what will get you a reward or enable you to avoid the punishment. So it knocks out your inner compass or your inner guidance system. And then we wonder why people go crazy, you know, like with Enron or whatever, um, in, in, not, in not bringing conscience and values and vision and all the things that make life a good society together. It's not there. Why? Because it's been knocked out. It's not just in the justice system. It starts with the family, you know, child rearing model, also in schools with grades. You don't go in there learning what excites you. You do whatever will give you the grade. So what we're talking about is a fundamental reconsideration of how we, um, what is justice? It's, it's balance and harmony in relationships, and how do we establish that? and that the model that we're using is not just about courts and it's not just about prisons. Those are the extreme cases. But the model that is sort of derailing us is, is absolutely pervasive in our society, and it's a model of justice that, you know, is this external model. So when it's external, you think, well, I have to look good to other people, or I have to do what, I have to hide things, because if they really find out what's really going on with me, they won't agree, and I won't get reward, or I'll get punished just for who I am if I don't fit in. So it's very deep. It's very profound what we're talking about. Well, I think so. And, and to show our audience how you do this for the reader, you, I mean, you make clear and, and you ask these very provocative questions. Is what we're doing really creating justice among us? Mm -hmm. you know, does it make us better people? Does it heal our wounds? Do we understand each other any better? So, so the truth is the answer to all those is no. What mm -hmm. we're doing is not working in the world. And it's a question of wholeness. I mean, that's an important word here, it, 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 and it can be one of the tests on it, whether a system or a, a way of doing things is just or not. Does it lead towards wholeness, or does it lead toward greater fragmentation and disconnectedness? Let's look at some ways of first approaching it philosophically, and then you've done a great job of demonstrating its application, how one can be responsible for committing a crime without being punished. That's, that's a wonderful one that you raise. Um, responsible means, well, what is the crime? The crime caused some kind of hurt or harm. Uh, when you are accountable to what happens, you confront the harm that you did. In restorative justice, it's very common. I mean, it's, it's part of the practice for the offenders to face their victims and to see the harm done. And if the victim isn't up to that, which, you know, which I would certainly understand they might not be, then they face other victims of similar crimes or, or harms. And then, say, in the circle practices, which comes from the indigenous people, there are many different forms of restorative justice, but in the circle practice, they work together to figure out how can we make things right? How can we make amends? I mean, naturally, some cases, loss of life, you know, that's pretty far, but there still can be a lot of healing that can go on. So being accountable for a crime, putting somebody in prison, a lot of times people would rather go to prison 
then go to these um, restorative justice measures because they're much more difficult to actually face the harm you did and have right. to work to make it right. Exactly, because what it says is that we as a society um, are going to give a human an opportunity to feel the pain they've caused someone now and to restore the life that they've injured. So, and, and there are lots of different ways that that becomes a negotiation. But don't you think one of our inherent challenges is that when a government and the people that make a free quote unquote government possible gives itself the authority to kill and it sometimes it seems without any discrimination that it becomes much harder for us as a collective to envision another way of of justice happening because the state itself does not sh demonstrate a model of what is just well, i think that's absolutely true i mean um how how can uh how can capital punishment lead us towards greater wholeness? Right. It, by definition, is going to be um, uh, the, uh, ex the, the disconnecting of a, of a part of who we are as a, as a society by trying to throw one part of it away. Um, it, and it can't work. I've, I've argued for a long time that, that there are two horrors in capital punishment, and one is not greater than the other. One is, is the taking of the human life, and the other is what the taking of the human life does to the people who take it. And we're the people who take it because it's done in our name. Yeah, and I think that that's a very important point. So for those of us such as myself and in my more political days, we would have these vibrant discussions as to why I was opposed to capital punishment. And much in the way you said, and firstly because the road to capital punishment itself has such gross discrimination so that even that isn't in balance as perverse as it is. We'll be back for more for a fascinating discussion of the mystic heart of justice with Denise Breton and Stephen Lehman. Let me come back to the comment that you made about, you know, what happens when we have a system of justice based on retribution. Share with us a bit about the process of restorative justice as done in, like, family group counseling. I love the stories you shared about Terry O'Connor of Australia. Right. Well, that's, um, that's, a tr uh, that's a way of doing restorative justice that's based on a Maori, a Maori, different, uh, different ways, model um, in New Zealand, where, Australia and New Zealand, where uh, they bring, it, it's mostly a lot of work done with young people, and actually many um, people go for restorative justice around juvenile cases because you don't want to lose people for their whole lives. So there's a tremendous incentive to bring restorative practices to young people, and that's where this grew out of. So when something happens, you know, a kid screws up, they, um, they bring in the families, uh, the friends, everybody to, to a session, and they, they just sit them all down together. There's a lot of preparation beforehand that's very important. Um, and they share their feelings, and they share what's going on. And these are profoundly transforming experiences for everybody, and certainly for the young people. I mean, you, everybody can get caught up in stuff and they end up doing things they never would have otherwise done. And then when they sit down and really see the consequences of it, the human realities of it, it's profoundly changing. I mean, and, and back to a discussion that we were beginning to develop about when the state, with the big S, gives its, itself the permission to do what if you did as a householder to your neighbor would be considered capital murder. Mm -hmm. We have a real disproportionate way of evaluating under, oh, under certain circumstances we can kill innocents and under others we can't. Well, that's right. I mean, it's the same thing with corporal punishment. We beat our kids to teach them that um, that hitting is wrong. Um, we 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 kill um, uh, murderers to teach uh, everyone else that killing is wrong. It it's, it creates a cognitive dissonance, and it's that we know statistically it doesn't um, uh, deter uh, murder, and um, it's not surprising that it doesn't. I can tell you what it does to us psychologically. Well, and, and you look at it as a society, it, it takes such a total lack of integrity and dishonesty to say one thing and do another. Absolutely, and, and I mean, it's not as if people don't notice, and I think that's what needs to be brought in. We need to look at what are we actually doing and what are our methods. Are these methods really creating the kind of world, the kind of justice that we're looking for? And they're not. They're not at all. If anything, they're creating the opposite. You know, just as you say, it's creating, it's modeling violence as a solution. I mean, the same thing, we may not want to get into it, but it's the same thing with war, you know. Are we going to create a peaceful world by killing other people, you know? 
Well, I think that's the right question because ultimately what we do in a microcosmic level in our neighborhood and through our criminal justice system, quote unquote, which is itself often criminal, (laughs) more criminal than the crimes it adjudicates to. Absolutely. And how then does, and and I think it's important to talk about the media's role in all of this. Let's let's describe the exploitation of violence for, for making money. It's become a utility. Well, yeah, it is. I mean, it's probably the, um, if not the number one saleable uh, commodity, um, it's number two, and sex is the only other one. Um, we see it in movies, on television. Um, we see it in the news that the mainstream media chooses to cover. Um, the old adage, if it bleeds, it leads. Um, it, we, we, we well, tell you what, we're going to hold that thought. We'll come right back to it with our guests on Future Talk. And we were talking, Steve, just before the break about the role of media and imaging and this over inundation that our society has of just raw, unmitigated violence. It's not much different than um, what we put into our body determines the health of our body. What we feed into our mind, into our psyche, is going to um, be what the, the psyche and the mind um, puts back out. And, Right now, we're, we're on a real serious chunk diet of, of violence in our culture. And, and so then, as you point out in your book, The Mystic Heart of Justice, is that it's a question of do we have heart? It, and I don't mean that as a silly kind of, you know, wishy-washy, oh, I care for this person, but do we care for more than just the immediate result? And, and Denise, maybe you can address this because you write about it so beautifully. The bigger picture of how we are one and the indigenous people saw that when one person committed a serious crime it was as if the whole community had committed the crime oh absolutely and and i think that's uh, i mean you express it beautifully I, I, that's a truth and so the consequence of it is that anytime there is a conflict or a disharmony it's a sign i mean it's it's not a a, a negative thing it's a time to learn about what's going on in the community what are the patterns in our relatedness that are causing us harm and I think if we look at all the violence that's out there, you could also say that's a tremendous screaming on the part of the whole culture that we have to look at how we're relating because it is causing a huge amount of pain that we're just obsessed with looking at. So instead of saying, oh, we look at the symptoms, let's try to find out the causes. What, what's behind that? What's setting us up to feel, uh, to operate in such conflictual ways? And it comes absolutely from this oneness that we have with, with each other and with what's going on in the society and we can use that as a positive thing to learn what's going on and then to change it because we can i mean there's nothing fixed about this well exactly these are choices that are made and we make them sometimes by complicit apathy Mm -hmm. and at other times by actually engineering its perpetuation so one of the issues then is the issue in our society there's an edict that really came from plato i mean as good of thing as he may have done in some respects he also made in a certain respect it okay to lie (laughs) about how you're doing what you're doing and we now have this control by force when we come back we're going to look at that in depth as you do in the mystic heart of justice you're listening to future talk find us at www.futuretalk.org We really do live in the present day modern era still under a very antiquated if you've got the power and you got the force, might makes right. Absolutely. That's that's the model of anarchy um, that we challenge. Um, There are two senses of anarchy. One is the anarchy of, of everybody following their individual conscience, whether the government says that's okay or not, like Gandhi. I mean, he's, he's a true anarchist. Whereas what we're saying in the book um, is that there's this other model that truly creates chaos in the society, and that's precisely that, the model of might makes right, because it has no wisdom within it. It has no principle. It may be uh, the, the wisdom expressed by the majority, but it may not. Of itself, might makes right has no logos, and so... It, it just creates a complete mess. When we look at the different mystic traditions, and because your book is entitled The Mystic Heart of Justice, whether we look at the Vedic tradition or the Buddhist or the Kabbalist within the Jewish tradition or some of the more esoteric Catholic writings, one discovers that justice is balanced by mercy. So let's talk about that. And, and with it also comes, you mentioned one word, wisdom, and another's understanding. How, then, would a model, if we were to unfold justice with mercy, 
show us a different way? Well, I, I would think justice, they, they split it off justice and mercy. I mean, our culture thinks about it that way. And I think that's the old model. That's the retributive model. Like, I have to punish you, but maybe it's for your own good, and that's the mercy. And that's not it. Um, what we're thinking is justice is uh, from the tradition of valuing, like Steve was talking about in the indigenous communities. Everybody is too valuable to be thrown away. So the real justice is the justice that nurtures people and says, okay, you, you screwed up, you hurt somebody. Let's work together to find out, as you were saying, though, um, in the community, what's leading to these patterns that cause us to hurt each other. So the mercy is that all of us come out of a model that is uh, causing harm, and we don't even know it. So the mercy is, is restoring us to our souls, to who we really are, to who we really want to be, to our real connectedness. What could be greater mercy than that? What could be truer justice? One of the one of the models you both present. Excuse me, Steve. Did you want to add to that? Well, I was going to say that that mercy and wholeness extends to the victim as well. One of the problems with our current system is that not only is the offender cut off from the rest of society, but so is the victim. In our society, the, in our our model of justice, the victim is the state, and it is the harm is done against the state, and so any retribution is up to the state. Anything that is owed is owed to the state and not to the actual person or individual or group of individuals that was harmed by the act. In the restorative model, the victim is given full voice to talk about what, what the uh, offense did to them, the hurt it caused, what their needs are, what they need to hear, what information they need to get. They become an important player because they, too, must be restored to the whole. Exactly, and the beauty, as you describe in the mystic heart of justice, is that there is a, an inner healing that does take place. One of the tools that you have given your readership in the mystic heart of justice, I thought was a beautiful kind of, you know, the look up, the look within, the look down. Describe for us one of the exercises actually any one of us can do when we're in a situation and we're trying to determine Firstly, how do I not react, but wait a moment, catch my breath, and then respond? Well, that, um, that, uh, those, those levels that you describe are taken from indigenous uh, teachings, and they sort of cast you or put you in the frame of, of the whole, really. Uh, they give you a sense, we look up, we look up to our connectedness. You know, a lot of times when we're in crisis, we feel all alone, and we feel isolated, so if you say, oh, I can look up, I can look to the wholeness, and I'm, I'm part of that, and I'm connected to all that is, and then I'm connected to, it makes you mindful of all the connections, and whichever ones you're able to, to do, then the, but that's not all, you start looking within, you look within to who you are, and to the inner presence, and to the core, the soul of the soul, the, you know, the ground of who you are, and, um, and then you look down, you look down to say, I can touch the earth, I can be grounded, I can do something with my life, who I am, my whole connectedness that is, comes to bear centered within me as my peace, my center, then flows out in a way that can bless uh, wherever I am. And that's true for everybody. That's, a, that's what justice is about. It's valuing. We're all aspects of the whole. So how can we throw anybody out? How can anybody's gifts be worth throwing away? Um, we need them all. We, we, can't, we, we need everyone here to have the society be fulfilled in that Looking up, looking within, looking down is, is um, a way of talking about that. And when you look, as the mystic heart of justice does, uh, about our way of being, it's not just about humans in relationship with each other, but justice is bigger. Justice is about what about the biosphere, what about other sentient life. Uh, and, and address that for a moment, because so often we have ceded to corporations only that authority that literally godly, divinely, by incarnation, rests in the individual. Absolutely. Um, the, that's absolutely really true. Uh, the justice has to be a balancing of, of the humans within the whole totality. And, and what is that totality? Well, it keeps expanding out, but certainly it includes to, you know, the earth and the plants and, and the animals and getting a balance there. I mean, the right relationship to animals, what we do to animals, is horrific, you know. And your example of the corporations is a good one. There's a recent book out called The Divine Right of Capital that makes that argument mm -hmm. that um, we've replaced this idea of the divine right of kings, this um, sort of strange idea that um, certain certain people born into certain families have, um, have a connection to God that denied the rest of us. And we've now invested that same divinity in 
capital in um, in corporate power and um, given it um, ultimate power over really the, the, the human needs uh, that it originally was supposed to serve. Right. So again, and we find this in so many of the discussions we hold on Future Talk, if we look at our ills, regardless of its field, it's our perspective. Do we come, and I always come back to it, and I know people think I get a little redundant, but it's it's a chant I think worth making, which is, where is our reverence for life? If, it, if we had reverence for life, we would be addressing drug abuse not as a crime against society, but as an injury to the person's own body, and how can we help them? Not how do we lock them away and make them drug addicts for the rest of their life on top of being you know, more violent than when they went in. Let's talk about some of the very specific things you do in the Mystic Heart of Justice about principled negotiating. And, and I think it's important because there are lots of business people in our listening audience who work with large communities of people. And knowing how to negotiate many needs is also part of justice. It's not just about waiting until something aberrant happens. Absolutely. Um, well, the, the book here, uh, we were re- using the example of... Um, uh, Fisher and Yuri's getting to yes as a case of how justice is bringing the unseen to the seen. There are different methods. What we're really saying justice is, is it's something unseen among us. And we have to bring that unseen quality into the visible interactions that we have. What we tend to do is just bargain on the visible level and think, oh, we're just moving around visibles, whether it's money or interests or, you know, positions. But what we need to do is lift it up and bring the unseen values into it. And, and that's what um, Getting to Yes does. That's what restorative justice does. It's bringing values into how we work things out. For example, one of the things they say, uh, focus on the deep spiritual, the whole person, the whole situation interest, not just your superficial position. If it's a superficial position, you know, I'm going to take this line no matter what. Well, you know, maybe that serves your interest, but maybe there are a zillion other ways that serve your interest in that one position. And, and, and one of the things you point to when love enters this equation of what is compassionate justice as well as justice that has a positive outcome is, is that sometimes it gives us, I mean, sometimes these moments, these crises, give us an opportunity for something new to unfold rather than just doing the same old, you, you know, ran into my tree or my yard and I'm going to sue you. Well, right, and, and, and one of the ways we, we get to this new way of seeing things is by moving from dialectic into dialogue. Mm-hmm. The circles really embody the idea of dialogue, which is an exchange, um, not an argument. It's not, it doesn't end up with winners and losers. It ends up with, with wholeness, which is, which is winning for everyone involved. Um, again, um, the, the narrow framework of, of, of how we see justice now is, is predicated on an idea that, we, that, that my self-interest and your self-interest are necessarily in conflict. Right, and in competition. And in competition. Right. But a, but a vision of of uh, the universe as whole and as um, society as whole, as culture as whole, and as, as the whole a biosphere as whole, takes a whole different, takes a completely different turn. And it says that your self-interest, your true self-interest and my true self-interest must be somehow the same. And in dialogue, we can find out how they're the same. We can come together then, and then and that's when we have real community and not the kind of pernicious anarchy that Denise was talking about earlier. Well, and it's also what you're saying about love. You know, love is the sense what blesses one blesses all. That what, what is truly good for me and a blessing to me, because we're all connected, blends with what's a blessing to you and to others. And that means if somebody's being hurt, then we're all being hurt. So this connectedness really makes us think about things in a way that's different, but that does bring in this love. Love is the deep holding everybody in a loving way. And when things go wrong to, to not stop that. That's one of the big issues that's raised in restorative justice. We have our personal values, which are about love and honesty and integrity and care and respect. And then the minute conflict arises, we develop a whole different set of values. And then it's <laughs> beat the other and kill exactly. them and knock them out. And and now I can let my horrible self really be as horrible as horrible yeah, once. Let's let loose and, you know, <laughs> nail them. And that doesn't work. You know, the same values that, that make life happy 
um, day to day, we have to bring them to our conflicts too. Exactly. And and when I use the word negotiation, people often think what is meant by that is somebody giving up something and compromising this mm. versus as in principle negotiating, mm -hmm. inventing an option for mutual gain. Whatever Absolutely. happened to everybody actually benefiting by you know, some form of giving up in a way that produces a bigger getting. Absolutely. Which love does. Absolutely. And and I think the Buddhists, and many have joined their, our program, have talked about compassionate co-arising. Yep. But I want to ask you in our last few moments, what's soul got to do with it? Oh, soul's got everything to do with it. I mean, soul, that's, well, if you, you mentioned... It's you a good song. If I could sing it better, I'd sing it. Yeah, right, <laughs> right, right, right. There we go. I'm not singing it. Um, soul, I mean, soul is the essence of who we are. We've got to bring that to justice, and justice has to be rooted in who we are. Otherwise, we're a bunch of zombies, and how are we going to get justice out of that? So if, if we can be present to who we are truly, then we connect with our reality, and that connects us the, with the reality of everybody else. That's soul. So we need soul present justice, not justice that's just treating us like a bunch of externals and we can be controlled like uh, what rats in a maze. It's right. not fair to the rats, I must say. Right, and, and I think in the Mystic Heart of Justice, you've done just a beautiful job of exploring that there are already people executing this vision. Maybe it's a poor choice of word yeah, in the yeah. context <laughs> of this conversation, but utilizing this vision and applying it in ways that really are nurturing, really are restorative to both victims as well as those that perpetrate a crime against, you know, another person or their property. And it's working. It's working beautifully. It's, uh, the, the effectiveness is astonishing. Um, it's, it's sort of uh, proving the uh, assumptions that um, we make about how, who we really are and um, how we come together in the practice of, uh, of, of, of healing these. Our guests this portion of the program have been Denise Breton and Stephen Lehman, their book, The Mystic Heart of Justice. I did want to mention that they are starting a press entitled The Living Justice Press. And in days to come, you'll be able to go to their website at www.livingjusticepress.com or livingjusticepress.org. And their first pamphlet will be about peacemaking circles that are going on around the nation. One of the things I, I think really just important to mention in summary about this notion of restorative justice and looking at our current system of punishment and reward is to just ask yourself, is the system making us happy as a civilization? You know, does it make for a better world? Does it enhance motivation? Does it really make anybody's life fuller? And I think if you are honest with yourself, the answer will not be yes. It has occurred to me often, and I've done some work and taken part in supporting those who have done an awful lot of prison work, and those who knew my work as a geopolitical activist know of my opposition to the criminalization of drugs and prostitution, because the cornerstone of law in our republic is that if there's no injury to another person or their property, it is as if no crime has been committed. So much of the problem we have with justice in our society today is that we have the state with the big S making laws that are themselves unjust because what a person does to their own body is their own business and what a person does of a legal with a legal consenting adult whether we like it or approve of it or think it moral is irrelevant to whether or not it is as though a crime were committed so i think that really important and the other thing that i've noticed about these really big life questions of how do we create justice is that if we are going to continue with these kinds of penal institutions whatever happened to beauty have you ever thought about the impact that beauty has on the soul of every human? There was a program in Alabama that I was aware of one year of indoor gardening in a prison population. And if you talk to these men, some who were multiple serial murderers, people who had had horrendous childhoods, exacted a price on society for their lack, they described crying over their tomato plants. There's a quality of beauty and love and nurturing and reverence for life that I think is restorative and is much of what they spoke of. And remember, whatever it is, if we do it, it will happen. So let's infuse it with love.